there's something about her spirit that I think has it has survived. I mean, I've brought her back to life in this novel, mm-hmm. but actually, if you if you look at fashion for the last 50 years, so many huge designers have cited Talita Getty as their muse. So she continues mm-hmm. to inspire. <laughs> Welcome to our latest book reporter talks to interview with our guest, Jane Green. We are going to be talking about her latest novel, Sister Stardust. Now, Jane and I had a really fun chat about this book a couple of weeks ago at an industry event. And it was one-on-one. We were on this like, you know, little room, like sitting along chatting virtually, of course. And I just said, oh my gosh, now I've got to read this book. And as soon as I read it, I was like, oh my gosh, I've got to bring it to our readers because here's what I'm going to do. It's atmospheric. Sister Sardas is going to get you back in the 60s in Morocco. And you're going to get there in about two seconds, like as you start reading this book. It's those hedonistic days. We're going to go into, oh, let's just say sex, drugs, and rock and roll. We're definitely going to be there. It's a book reporter bets on selection. I'm sec- and I'm selecting it for setting, character, and story because they all flow completely together. So welcome, Jane. So nice to have you here. Oh, Carol, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. And I've like, you know, dressed. I'm like, you know, here we go. Okay. The hedonistic 60s. I'm ready to go. Here <laughs> we go. So start out. Tell us about Sister Stardust. Tell us about this book I'm crazy about. So um, Sister Stardust was inspired by a photograph that I saw when I was probably a teenager growing up in London of this spectacularly beautiful woman who was sort of almost in a semi crouch with one leg extended on a rooftop in Marrakesh wearing this exquisitely embroidered Moroccan wedding caftan Um, and behind her was a man in a hooded robe looking quite mysterious and I I was instantly transfixed. I discovered that her name was Talita Getty. She was married to Paul Getty Jr., who was the son of the richest man in the world. Um, And together they bought this dilapidated palace in Marrakesh and renovated it. And because it was the 60s and counterculture and and everybody in Europe was doing the North African hippie trail, um, everybody stopped off at the Gettys. So they actually threw a New Year's Eve party um, in 1967. And uh, there's a, a somebody, I can't remember whose diary it was. It wasn't Paul, but it was John Hopkins and his Tangier diary said, that Paul McCartney and John Lennon were so stoned they couldn't get off their backs from the floor all night. They just lay on their backs. Um, And they were known for throwing these unbelievably decadent wild parties. Anyone who was anyone was there, Gore Vidal, Jane Fonda, um, William S. Burroughs, the Rolling Stones, they were great friends. Mick Jagger and Marianne Faithful were there all the time. And so I created my protagonist, this little country mouse, Claire, and she gets swept off to Marrakesh by a, a rock band who are actually completely inspired by the Rolling Stones, but specifically uh, there was a love tri- triangle between Brian Jones, who was the founder of the Rolling Stones, and his girlfriend, Anita Pallenberg, and Keith Richards. And, and I really drew from that from, for the storyline. Um, but my sweet Claire, who is renamed Cece because it's more glamorous, um, she goes off to Marrakesh. It all looks heavenly, but of course, behind closed doors. And by the way, this is all, tr- I mean, Claire is not true, but Talita Getty is true, the Rolling Stones. And behind closed doors, um, while Vogue were writing about, Vogue was writing about Mrs. Getty and her glamorous souk chic, you know, and she was a muse of Yves Saint Laurent, but they were also quietly diving into, first of all, opium addiction and eventually heroin addiction. And she ended up dying a, a very early and tragic death with some mysterious circumstances around it. Um, and I just sort of been obsessed with her my whole adult life but I didn't know very much about her. So this gave me an opportunity to do a very deep dive and I loved every second of it. 
Yeah, well, we can tell. It comes across on the pages that you loved her as a person, yeah. though you saw every side of her. And we'll get into that as well. But you didn't see just the fun, fun, loving, like, uh, come come follow me wherever I go. Yeah. And it's interesting that you loved her for that long a time. Because I think when you do, the idea that person kind of marinates in your head. Yeah. And it's like, how would I portray her? What would I do with her? How could I pull her together? She's so charismatic. She's one of these charismatic people that follow was that something that you saw as you were researching about her? Because I know you did a lot of reading for this. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I suppose I must have I must have somehow sensed it just from looking at the photographs because there was something so compelling for me. I mean, I just, I still do. I mean, every time I look at photographs of her, I just feel myself being drawn in. Um, but there was there was much that I discovered that I didn't know, that I hadn't known. And, um, you know, she was she was actually born in Java, was part mm -hmm. of the Dutch East Indies. And when the mm -hmm. Japanese invaded, they threw her family into prison camps and she was tortured. So she covered up, she was tremendously beautiful, very exotic looking, um, with these sort of uh, wide spaced almond shaped eyes. And, and everybody who knew her, described her as just as being an enchantress mm -hmm. she was so vivacious and fun and always laughing with this and and free of course it was the 60s and you know we suddenly had the pill for the first time and Britain had its own music we had the Beatles and the Rolling Stones but even in in the free love culture of the 60s Talita was was particularly free mm -hmm. um and there's something about her spirit that I think has it has survived. I mean, I've brought her back to life in this novel, mm -hmm. but actually, if you if you look at fashion for the last fifty years, so many huge designers have cited Talita Getty as their muse. So she continues mm -hmm. to inspire. So even without knowing that much about her, I think the the photographs they it comes across. Mm -hmm. I feel like she was really curious about life. She wanted to live it as big as she could. She wanted to go to the markets. She wanted to go to the places you weren't supposed to go just to go experience. And if she went into a place, it wasn't just to visit, it was to do a deep dive, whether it was in London, wherever she was, it was, I'm part of this place with my tribe around me. And was also yeah. with a tribe, always with a tribe of people. Yes. And I think the hedonistic lifestyle, I was trying to figure out what drew her to it. My theory is the way she grew up, like, you know, in so much hardship, do you yeah. feel the same way? Do you think that's from what you saw? I do. I, I actually think, I know that towards the end of her life when she and her husband separated and he was living with his mistress in Rome and she, he bought her as a wedding present, this wonderful house in Cheney Walk in Chelsea in London called, it was known as the Rossetti House. It's where the artist Rossetti lived in the late 19th century. So lots of kind of drama and intrigue in and drugs actually in that house um, mm -hmm. as well and and Paul Getty was fascinated by the pre-Raphaelites and and so he bought that house for her and she was very depressed she was having thyroid problems which actually I, you can see in a lot of her photographs you can see the the hint of a goiter you can you can see that that it didn't surprise I mean I I sort of I, I, I could see that I wondered whether she had thyroid problems and then read somewhere that she had. And she was terribly depressed. And actually, I think that her life was very much a roller coaster and the trauma. I mean, look, today we go and see therapists or we, you know, we, there are so many ways to help. But then I, I think she self medicated with alcohol primarily, mm -hmm. actually. Um, some drugs, although I think drugs were not her, her primary um, addiction and parties people I think as long as she kept running as long as she was surrounded by people she could she she was running from herself and and mm -hmm. ultimately I, I think she couldn't yeah and I it was, it was like the extrovert problem. part of her the extrovert part of her got kept her going yeah. let's have people over let's do this I actually love the part where Paul just came out and goes who are all these people just go you're freeloading it was such yeah. a great line of leave just go yeah. now you yeah. know and it happened. I mean, it, he actually was. He, you know, Paul was very extroverted when he was young. His mother, Anne Rourke, was um, he was brought up in San Francisco, and, and she was a she was a wonderful socialite, very extroverted. All his friends would come to their house to drink and party. 
but as he got older, he became more and more introverted. And actually, I, I think that was a, a terrible mismatch. I think they it, I think they truly did love each other, but I also think that he just couldn't keep up with with her pace and he mm -hmm. didn't want to. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want to. He he, but he enjoyed other things. He enjoyed classical music. Yeah. He enjoyed just sitting and reading. And that was not her. That was not her thing. It was just yes. to go go go. Yes, have, opera, book binding was a passion of his. Yeah. So now, have you spent time in Morocco? Have you been? I have. Yes, and I'm desperate to go back. I was actually in London um, two weeks ago, and I really thought, oh, I wonder if I can, because now that they've opened up Morocco, because it was closed for a long time because of the mm -hmm. pandemic, I thought, could I just scoot over there for a couple of days? And then I thought, you know, that's really, if I'm, if I want to, if I'm going to go, I need to go with my husband, preferably, or, or a girlfriend, or it's, what am I going to do in Morocco by myself? I mean, I do <laughs> have a couple of friends there, but I, I just like the same point. thing. You know, you captured the whole scene, not just the getting home, which sounds fabulous, but the bazaars and everything. And I have a friend who just got back and she's got all these pictures. And I was looking at her pictures on Facebook against what you wrote. And it was just, you really brought it to life because when I saw her pictures, I was like, oh, I know what that bazaar would be like. Oh, I know where those spices would be. I know. And just the colors and everything. It felt like it was sun kissed but also just vivid color all over the place. Like seriously, I was thinking you've got to wear something bright today because yeah. it's exactly the way you feel reading the book. Picture people sitting on the book all summer reading this book and oh, just like bright color against the sun. I, I hope so. Um, it's, it's if, you know, the first time I've ever written this kind of fiction, you know, whether, it, whether you call it biographical fiction or historical fiction, but I, I couldn't start writing it until I felt that I was there. And I know Morocco, but I don't, and I was born in the 60s, but I don't know the 60s, you know. And I, I all of that reading I did, I, I really, by the time I actually sat down and started writing, I felt like I was there. I felt like I, I lived that alongside Claire and Talita ev on every page. Mm -hmm. And it definitely comes across. It doesn't, it, it's not a moment where you don't feel like you're completely immersed in the culture. You know, you also brought up something really interesting in the book that we think about, but we don't think about because we were here in the States. And it was about Britain taking such a time, long time to recover after the war and how hard it was to come back. And it was a very bleak time. Yeah. And all of a sudden there was music coming out of America. It was Motown. It was whatever was coming, was coming out of the States. And then it was the uh, British invasion and it was the Stones and it was the Beatles. And then all of a sudden, I feel like Britain came back into its own. Like it yeah. came back to something that was ever to do. And it's the coolest music was then happening and all that kind of stuff. So let's talk about that because I think that I often forget about that part. And I think like these days when I'm watching pictures of Ukraine, where these whole cities are bombed out and you're getting a visual of bombed out London having to come back, but there are people that are going through a really hard time as the city is rebuilding. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, it took years. If you think, think back to the Second World War and we were, you know, London was, parts of London were completely decimated. I mean, there were, there were bomb sites everywhere because they would drop the doodle bugs. So they would, the bombs would drop in a line. So what you'd have is a line of streets and in the same place, like the houses would be destroyed. And, and there was no money and people lived on you know, rations for years afterwards. And Britain was just depressed and gray and sad and, you know, all of a sudden we got into the 60s and I think Britain then won the FA Cup final, which is, or the World Cup, Britain won the World yeah. Cup actually, which was, is huge in football or as mm -hmm. they over here, soccer. Um, I say football still, it's but football. So we won the World Cup and then out of nowhere, you know, having listened to sort of Motown and blues from America, if you wanted to listen to contemporary music, suddenly the Beatles appeared and the Rolling Stones and we had our own music for the first we had rock there'd never been pop stars before never been rock stars it just hadn't existed um and all of a sudden people Britain just came alive and people had money and young women went out to work and they had disposable income and there was a show on 
I'm not sure, I think it may have been, it's in the book, I don't remember when it was on, but called Ready, Steady, Go. Mm, yes. and, and it was, you know, it was every, they'd have all the bands on every week and the audience would be dancing and every week people would study what the host wore and then they'd go to Carnaby Street and buy what she wore as close as they could get. And it just, you know, London came alive. And also, of course, then as the 60s progressed, we had the psychedelic drugs, you know, thanks mm -hmm. to Timothy Leary over at Harvard doing all of his research into psychedelic drugs. And of course, they came over to England. And suddenly, you you know, you look at, I, I found myself staring at Sergeant Pepper the, at the album cover the other day. And I, I was thinking, if they deliberately made it like that for people who were on psychedelic trips and the, and all of the art actually if you look at all of the art that it was all because of everybody was tripping and then with the pill the, in England the pill was introduced to married women in 1963 and it was introduced to everybody in 1967 so suddenly what had been a conjugal duty sex was not about pleasure sex was we have a phrase you like lie back close your eyes and think of England and um and you know you were doing your duty to bear children for your husband but all of a sudden sex became you know and it was actually it became almost too um commonplace you know people a lot of women actually have have spoke out latterly saying they actually felt that they couldn't say no because they'd be deemed kind of non-groovy and mm -hmm. not part of the flow so they actually felt that they they had to and for others it was a source of enormous pleasure mm -hmm. um but it was just very different it was everything burst into color and it's also it was small enough that if you went out at night you could see the rolling stones you could see yeah. people not the band would be in the audience or the yeah. band might jump up on the stage and do something yeah. It was a very small place. It's not like America where it being even New York and the village, not same thing. It was all like, you know, just encapsulated in this one place. And it was the day that it could be a hangout or go to a big club. It could be this or that. And I just yeah. love the contrast yeah. of what was going back and forth that you really brought out to light. You know, um, also I love up, up front, you have an epigraph that's from the secret language of birthdays. And I have to tell you, I have this book. And I was like, wait a second, this is what she did. When you gave some background about, about October 18th, 1940. So I had that book for two decades. What made you decide to do that? It's with this birthday, but what made you decide to do that and put that? Because it was just so spot on of sort of the astrological way you might've yeah. been thinking about her. Well, and, and by the way, something I discovered that was really interesting is everybody was obsessed with astrology in the 60s. Everybody would, it was all like, hey man, you know, what sign are you? Everybody wanted to know what stars, and everybody was obsessed. But to, And everybody was going to psychics as well. Talita refused to go. She never ever went. And I, I do wonder whether she somehow had a sense that she might hear something she didn't want to if she went, because I, I find it just so fascinating that all of those in her circle were going and she she would not, she refused. So I love that book, that mm -hmm. birthday book. And I just reading about myself years ago, found it spookily accurate. And while I was writing it, I just remember thinking, oh, I, I wonder what how they describe her. And it seemed to be so, so Talisha. And, uh, and so I decided to, to put that in. Yeah, and marrying that with the quote from you, Saint Laurent, was just like perfect because it was the two juxtapositions. It's how she came and who she became because yeah. he was dressing her. And it was the kind of thing where I just loved where they'd say, well, no, you don't have to buy it. He's just going to send me clothes. Like if you get a stain on it, don't worry yeah. about it. He'll just yeah. send me more because these women, I spent um, 17 years at Condé Nast, so I knew the fashion business and there are people, they love to dress, right? The designers just wanted you to be wearing their clothes and yeah. see how you looked in war and, and I felt like she was their muse in a lot of ways, but she was also, that's how it's supposed to look. That's how it's supposed to go. And they would go style her. They'd say, oh no, move this over a little bit more or. Yeah. And, and she would, you know, take, she was a muse for Yves Saint Laurent. And, and so she'd be wearing some fabulous couture thing with some, you know, local Marrakesh, robe on top she was always in robes and caftans and scarves and silks and 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 so she would make everything more exotic whatever it was that she put on she 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 added her own spin own spin and thing 
So Claire gets there. So, you know, okay, let's back up. The narrator is this naive young girl from a small town, small part, and she's totally drawn into this world. What was your reason to have a Claire narrating the story, an outsider doing it? Well, I, I didn't ever feel confident enough to tell the story from Talisha's mm -hmm. perspective, and also because her son is alive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there are people around, some of whom I was lucky enough to talk to, but there are people around who, who knew her, who loved her, and I, I wanted to be very careful with, with and respectful of, of how I wrote about her. But also I always loved, you know, the sort of Gatsby-esque thing of having a narrator who's standing slightly on the outside observing and, and, you know, in this case does get drawn in, but is able to sort of see things with a perspective that perhaps they can't, those who are in it cannot quite see, even though they recognize that she's sensible. And, and Paul actually in the book says to Cece, you know, look after her, be her friend. And, and Paul Getty in real life said that to a number of women. He knew that she needed she, a stable influence. He wanted her to have a stable influence. And he asked women to, that he trusted to, to look after her. And she wasn't going to just listen to him. She'd have to listen to somebody who, like, he was there, but he was also listening to opera and he was listening to classical music. And she was, ah. And he was, and he was a drug addict. I mean, he mm -hmm. was at the height of his addiction. So mm -hmm. he, he wasn't really capable of doing anything. And I think that was, that was the deep trauma that he then had to live with. Mm -hmm. That he felt culpable somehow in her death because... I don't know where the heroin came from. I imagine it may have come from him, but but even if it didn't, she took the overdose. And when he looked in, there were people around all night. When he looked in, he thought she was sleeping. Mm -hmm. And that went on for hours when he thought she was sleeping and, and she was dying. And it's well, because he was so wrapped up in what he was doing. It's like, oh, that's his, everybody yeah. can survive doing the amount of drugs I did, everybody else can do it. And it wasn't really what was going <laughs> yeah. on. Yeah. So Claire becomes CC, And with this small change of name, she shreds who she was. Like she just takes it away. She gets swept up and she seems to have no fear. And it's like, suddenly the small town girl can embrace life. She's been in this place where nobody was doing it. It wasn't, was that what you were looking for in a character? Was somebody that could go from here to here and just go, wham, this is me. Well, I, I wanted her to just slowly fall under the spell because it is, it was just the Arabian Nights. I mean, it, it was extraordinary how they lived. They would regularly have 30 people to lunch or they or 30 people for dinner on the roof. And all of a sudden, all the houseboys would be taking everything up there or they'd decide to have a picnic in the Atlas Mountains and they'd all trek out there. And the houseboys would be carrying trays of onion tarts and 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 all this craziness. And, and when, when Cece first sees there and, and sees how these parties often devolved into these kind of orgiastic affairs. She's, she's frightened of it. She doesn't, mm -hmm. she's not ready. She, this isn't what she wants. This isn't what she'd anticipated. But as she slowly falls under Talisha's spell, there's, it reaches a point where there's nothing she won't do for her. Mm -hmm. And it really is, I mean, she, she falls in love with her, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, she casts the spell on the people yeah. that are around her and you just fall into there. You know, I guess one of the questions I was thinking of for book groups, because it'd be a fun book group book, especially over the summers. Um, how honest can Claire be as a narrator? Because she's still trying to see it. She's trying to, she's older now as she's writing this and she's looking back. Could she be, have been that honest when she was younger or she sort of at the time of her life? I think that's my book club question to toss out there is, could she have written this before or was she so swept up in it that she couldn't have taken that step back and said, what were we doing then? I think that she, I, I think that she would definitely have um, a much more open-minded approach. I think as we get older, we become much more accepting mm -hmm. and, and things that maybe seemed shocking when we were young, just uh, sort of par for the course. I also think that it was it was guilt that that kept her from revisiting those times because 
well, I, I won't give it away, but but I think she she carried tremendous guilt. I mean, I think she in my book, she carried the guilt, uh, just a sliver of the guilt that I I think Paul Getty Jr. in real life carried with him for the rest of his life. Yeah. And, and my CC has has a little of that. Yeah. So let's talk about the Riyadhs. Riyadhs, is that correct? Yeah. Where yeah. the wealthy people lived, because yeah. I love to hear you describe them because they were really these rundown places and then they made them into sort of palaces. Yes. Well, they were. So um, part of the Islamic religion is to not display wealth. I mean, it, it, it is not you are supposed to, to keep your wealth private. And so um, in these uh, in these Muslim countries, often the homes, and in, in Morocco, the homes are all hidden behind walls. So you can be walking down like a little narrow cobbled alley. There's usually a few stray cats and, and there are just these wooden doors that look like nothing in a wall and you think it's nothing. And you step through these doors into a paradise, these, tiled courtyards and the traditional tile in Morocco is this deep green tile and the, the courtyards always have a fountain in the middle and and so everything happens in the court and around it's built around the courtyard and so the women are able to then dress freely they don't have to be covered up because it's just their family in 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 these homes um, and many of the grand ones are linked it's a series of riads linked together so they can have numerous courtyards and I think um, Le Palais des Ahir, um, which is the, the, they all called it Sidi Mamoun, which is after the area in which it sits in Marrakesh. Um, I believe it's four riads, four, four courtyards um, in, in there, and gardens, and, and just magnificent, and they had peacocks, actually, at the time, which I think Paul Getty hated because of the peacock poop. Um, yes. But just and giant, you know, palms and 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 jacaranda blossoms, which are this lovely lilac just scattering on the deep green tile, and then they burn fires at night, and and the houseboys would light these fires with sandalwood and just extraordinary smells, and and that's the thing. I mean, Morocco is just a feast for the senses. Everything, mm -hmm. everything just feels, smells, tastes richer and deeper and brighter and that's what really came across in the book like I felt like I was there I felt like I could see the gardens and then beyond that I feel like I could taste the food when you weigh the foods out on the table and explained how everything was going to be there I felt like it was this sumptuous banquet that was laid before us to sit and just relish and enjoy and I was like okay now what am I going to eat for lunch oh let's see more crackers with peanut butter you know what I mean because <laughs> yeah. like, I'll run downstairs and just go get that yeah. So it's in your research, it seems like everybody was sort of in awe of her, though. I mean, they just wanted to sit there and look at Talitha and go, oh, look at this beautiful woman, blah, blah, blah. But by the same token, I think you did such a good job of portraying the other side of the whole group because everybody would come to Cece and kind of confide and tell her it's like she was part of their world, but she hadn't been there that long. So they feel like there was like this moment of realness about her as well, that they yeah. could come over and say how they felt. Yeah, they they refer to her as as an innocent, and there's mm -hmm. something about that that they they absolutely cherish. I mean, yes, they are. They I think they know that she will inevitably be pulled in, and yet they they so cherish having somebody there who can witness it, love them, and not get caught up in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's this cornucopia of drugs on every single day that's like insane. And of course, we have the drug dealer coming on every, the candy man coming on any single day. And it was something about tuning out the way that things had been. And I feel like trying to see the world through new eyes. That's what I was seeing that the people were trying to do still. Like that moment of it's old Britain, new Britain. Let's go in with colors and lights and new feelings. Yeah. And I think also, um, you know that the the whole thing with drugs and i i you know go back to that idea of self-medicating with drugs and also i think when the world is really terrifying sometimes we look to alter our realities a bit and i think it's happening again now i think there are actually a lot of parallels we have the race wars we have war we are in probably the most frightening place we've been in mm -hmm. decades and i also see and it's not quite a counterculture because there isn't 
one culture anymore you know especially in america it's so divided and mm -hmm. and yet there is this this movement of spirituality and and drugs are coming back in vogue in a different kind of way but we we see you know marijuana being legalized everywhere mm -hmm. and now more and more scientific studies are uh proving that that the use of psilocybin um which is the the compound found in hallucinogenic mushrooms and drugs can be incredibly effective at curing anxiety and depression and so i i understand i i sort of i think that there are a lot of parallels between the 60s and and now and it's also we also see the what's happening with fentanyl that you find that they're kids that are buying drugs on TikTok or by, by somebody they meet on TikTok or somebody they meet on Instagram. So our worlds have changed. It's not just you go into the city to some place to go do this. You can do this anywhere at this point wow. and people can reach you in any place. And the number of people that, oh, this is cocaine, but it's laced with fentanyl and now you're dead. And now it's you know just what has ended up happening yeah. in it's and they're, they're parallels to before of with heroin and there's pair of bad batches and things yeah. like that where we're going on as well. Well, know? by the way, I mean, look, the 27 Club. I mean, there so many in the 70s, so many people were lost to to drugs at such a, you know, whether Jimi Hendrix, um, you know, I mean, just I could go on forever, Janice right. Joplin and um Jim Morrison and and then of course latterly Amy Winehouse but but again you know when when you have those kinds of drugs you you have those kinds of deaths those yeah. tragic senseless early deaths and Talita is one of them and you also reference Mick Jagger as being the smart cool stone and it's very interesting because they said that he partied but he still kept his wits about him and I've heard this about him for years and did that surprise you during your research well the whole thing surprised me actually because I didn't really know anything about the stones I wasn't particularly interested and actually ironically Keith Richards lives about eight minutes away from my house I've never seen him um although three years ago had I passed him in the street I would have just been like oh it's Keith Richards big deal today I think I, my heart might stop um because part of my research into this book involved this huge dive into the Rolling Stones and I hadn't realized how um how intertwined their lives were with Morocco in the 60s I mean mm -hmm. Morocco was really a safe harbor for them they were great friends with the Geshis particularly Mick and Marianne um but I I was fascinated by all of them and Keith in particular um and I've I've not only read I've I've watched so many interviews and films and documentaries and footage and and I have friends who know Mick Jagger actually I know I, I mean I do know people who know him and and he is clearly impossibly charming um but Keith I love Keith I you just, love Keith I just, <laughs> Keith's, Keith's my guy I just good and what a good a good a solid a musician's musician really his love is the music he doesn't care about the high life or any of that stuff. Whereas Mick, I think, was much more, he, he really liked mixing with the aristocracy, which was the other interesting thing, by the way, about the 60s. Class is so, um, it's so rigid in the UK and you would never mix classes, you know, the whole upstairs, downstairs thing. It doesn't matter how much money you make, you can never transcend the class into which you're born. And suddenly in the 60s, these like Cockney Barrow boys, like David Bailey, were becoming the the most celebrated photographers um, and and artists, and and so it became a meritocracy. And actually, mm. all of the aristocracy who would never have rubbed shoulders with the working classes before, suddenly they wanted to be best friends with Mick Jagger, they mm. and John Lennon. They all wanted to be friends, and so it it it. I I love how all of that class stuff sort of went out the window in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And it carries right through to uh, um, uh, Diana and Elton John. I mean, you think about all the years like going forward of exactly what would end up happening. You know, it's like Jagger went to the London School of Economics and they've often said he'd be drinking water. He wouldn't be drinking. He, he, he would not be doing what you think he'd do. He'd go home. And when there was some YouTube thing I found a couple of weeks ago, video of his exercise routine and what yeah. he does. And I thought... My God, to be in your seventies and jumping around like that yeah. on stage and so yeah. every night, 
every night doing that for nights on end, it's, you've got to be in fantastic shape. And, and the amount of discipline and control that mm-hmm. that requires mm-hmm. is extraordinary. And, and I think that is Mick. Mick is, is very, con- he's, he's just very controlled and mm-hmm. very disciplined. Whereas mm-hmm. Keith is like, he's just, you know, playing like, yeah. duh, me and Patty hanging out. I, I'd be friends with Keith. You'd be friends with Keith. Well, you know, it's funny because I always say that everybody's got to go see the Rolling Stones at least one time. And my son got one ticket a couple of years ago and went and I said, you just have to go. And I went and I had like the nosebleed seat at the garden, but I can still remember when everything opened like this on the stage, because it's, it's theater at the same time as it's performance. And it's a lot of what Talitha and was trying to put together at their home. It was theater. It was big. It was a show. Yes. every single night and I could just picture her walking into the kitchen and saying the food yes. this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it and it's not like they were making it up she was making it up yeah. oh, I had this great thing go do this and you just saw the upstairs downstairs there would be so interesting in Morocco I'm sure when they left people were like okay now I need a month of rest you know just because oh, oh yes what crazy that- thing are they going to do tonight yeah, their, their house manager actually said her most favorite time was when they weren't there because the house was quiet and empty. Mm-hmm. And she gave all of the staff tons of downtime because it was so frenetic and crazy when they were there. And it'd be crazy till four in the morning and then there'd be breakfast and then yeah. there'd be this and that. You know, she died when she was 30. I went and did like some little deep dive of research there. So, so young to have died. And I wonder what if what happened to her if drugs didn't take her. I would wonder, like, okay, she would be 81 at this point. I did that math too. And you think about these people who were at that point in their lives, they're, a lot did not survive. I mean, let's just get real. There were a lot of people did overdose or terrible things happened to them along the way, accidents, you know, things like that. But you just sort of wonder her at 81 right now, what she would have been like and how her spirit you know which you harnessed you know yeah I can't imagine her old it's almost a bit it's a bit like Princess Diana I think Mm -hmm. these sometimes these women who are terrifically damaged and carry that trauma with them I I I can't imagine how they would have continued to live which may sound like a really um morose thing to say Mm -hmm. but but I in some ways I, it, 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 or there's almost an inevitability about it mm-hmm. because it's like, okay, well, what happens then? Well, she did have a child. She did have a child with him after it, you know, the period of time during this book, she had three stepsons when, when, uh, the, during the time frame of this book. And it's not in the pages that we write here, but did you, in your research, did you learn about her time, like becoming a mother, what it was like for her in yeah. any of the research you did? Yeah. I, um, I think it was a little overwhelming, actually. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think she really knew how to be a mother. She had an Italian family living with her in Cheney Walk, and and certainly some of the interviews I've read, she seemed to be a little overwhelmed. I don't doubt that she adored her son, mm-hmm. um, and and I think you can see it in the photographs. You can see that she loved him, but I also think she was on her own. This wasn't the life that she had... She, planned um her husband wasn't with her and I think actually whether it was depression caused by her thyroid issues or whether it was just depression I I don't think she was as present as she might have been and it was at a time in England I actually share his birthday um and 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 year of birth we were born on the same day and and it, it it English parenting in that time was very, very different to American parenting. I mean, children really were to be seen and not heard. You know, it was delightful to have you around if you were on your best behavior and and beautifully dressed, but otherwise you'd be sent off with the nanny. Mm. So it was always like, okay, here, gone. So a lot of, yeah. Was she brought up in that kind of environment as well after the time? Was she? So she, so her first few years were in the prison camp um then you know her mother died shortly after she was very close with her stepmother Mm -hmm. um her father remarried after three three years and and she was very close with her stepmother 
Um, but I, I don't know, actually, there's, there's very there's little no. about her relationship um, with them. She looks happy. Her, her stepmother, Poppet Paul, um, she became Poppet Paul, she was Poppet John, and she was the daughter of a, of a very famous British artist called Augustus John. Um, and there are wonderful pictures of Talita as a, as a young girl, you know, with Augustus, who, who was sort of bearded and larger than life, and they look like they adore each other. Yeah. So the scene, not heard. There you go. You know, yeah. move on, move on. You know, there's this wonderful line where Benji, who's another character in the book, talks about vacations and how magical they are. But then they end and you go back to your real life. Staying on vacation means they turn into something else. And it's such a great line because we've always been at places that we loved and we long to stay at longer. Yeah. But there's that moment where you need to leave. You need to go or you're going to stay. And I've been in ski towns where people stayed. And did you make it or not? I mean, I've from some friends have been marvelously successful, but some of them, it's just like this grind life from there. Yeah. I love that line. It was yeah. so like, you've got to go. If you stay, it's not going to always be like this. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. You know, my, and my kids are learning the hard way. My son took a gap year and decided to spend it, uh, living and working in Jackson hole, you know, mm -hmm. because he loves it and he's a ski bum and, mm -hmm. and he's supporting himself. He has two jobs and you know what? It is brutal. I mean, he mm -hmm. is lonely and isolated and, and it's been really, it, it was not at all what he thought it would be. Yeah, with people come, people go. They yeah. people come out there. They have money, then they don't have money. They lose their job. They don't like their job driving driving the shuttle bus for the ski resort, like whatever it is. And then they leave, and then all new visitors come every week. But they're on vacation, and you're not. And it's you can go out to the bars, but th there's some exotic thing about the people who live there though like you always if you go into a town you want to know the people who live there all the time like yeah. what's it like and I remember we spent, spent a lot of time in Vale Beaver Creek and there's that very high level that own those very 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 big homes yeah. and then there were the guys driving the shuttle bus they were yeah. living miles and miles and miles away yeah. because and it you'd see that juxtaposition in each of these places and when you realize um, Cece at one point was thinking of staying and running this place because it wasn't until he's like, oh, I think you could go run our home and you could go do this. And she's thinking this is great life. And he cautions her and says, let's pull it back. Let's pull back to reality. And I think that the reality was there. I don't think she had the same kind of reality to leave that. I don't think people were like, they didn't want her to be real. They wanted her to stay. And I think if she had said, we're not going to do this anymore, people would have been like, oh, like she wouldn't have that same yeah. aura about her. And I, I think she knew that. I mean, she, she was terrifically insecure, which was also extraordinary mm -hmm. to discover mm -hmm. because here's a woman who is not only, you know, beautiful and charming and, and you know, spellbinding. She's also married to the son of the... I mean, they, she should have everything. Mm -hmm. um, and yet she always felt that people were only friendly with her and interested in her because she was with Paul Getty. And, mm -hmm. and I think always worried that she wasn't enough mm -hmm. on her own. Yeah, she's not going to be doing it as now. Okay, we've got to ask, have you made the hashish uh, fudge recipe in the book? <laughs> um, not yet, but I do actually have... Uh, I do actually have all the nuts and the rose water and the lavender petals downstairs. And now I have to just get myself to a dispensary to, <laughs> to, buy, the, to buy the marijuana to make the majun, the cannabis sponge. <laughs> the cannabis sponge that's going to go with this. Okay, how about the cheese souffle? Have not made that. I've not made that. Why did you include the recipes? Because they're, they're oh. incredibly fun to read. I mean, I'm looking at those ingredients going, mm, this would be fun to try. Yeah, I just, um, I just, I love food. I love, and food for me is, it, it's, it's soul connection. It's not even about the food. It's for me, it's the way that I love the people I love. I love them through food. And, mm -hmm. and I just felt that the majun was such a, an intrinsic part of life in Marrakesh at that time that I had to include the recipe. My publisher actually wanted me to take it out and I, I just, refused um and then I love that Bill Willis who was this transplant this Alabama boy who was the Alabama or Kentucky Kentucky um who who was deeply in love with Marrakesh he adored everything about Morocco and yet 
he taught his Moroccan cook to to cook his mother's southern recipes and <laughs> and uh, I just love that juxtaposition so I, I had to find a quintessentially southern cheese souffle recipe. I tell you I definitely want to try that we had, we had a um, a plethora of egg whites a couple of weeks ago and I was looking for things to do and it's like the cheese souffle oh, yes, it would souffle. be absolutely perfect yeah. yeah gosh isn't that funny I know I haven't made souffle in years I used to make it all the time but it's so out of fashion now right right although fondue make, is coming back I used to make ra- um, raspberry souffles I used to make oh. those for dessert and they were just fabulous but you always had the egg whites that what to do the other night we made um key lime pie like two weeks in a row so we always put the egg whites in the refrigerator, swearing we're going to do something with them and then throw them out the next week because we did. And yes, I really don't like a white egg omelet. I know it's supposed to be fabulous for you, but not making the cut, you know, but <laughs> I think that I'm wondering what book groups are going to make because book groups, their recipes like right in the book. I want to see which recipe they go for. <laughs> Who's going to make the majoon? There um, we go. We have to sit there come, and see. I'm not I'll come and talk to you live. Don't do that. <laughs> now, do you do book club chats online? Do you have time to I, talk to readers? I do. I'd love to. I don't get asked very often, but when I am asked, I always say yes. Okay, terrific. So yeah. they can reach out to you on your website after they read the book? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Or um, Instagram, I find yeah. Facebook is overwhelming. I don't understand any of the inboxes, and I, so I, I don't tend to see messages on there. Instagram is a really good one. You'll find me on Instagram and jane at janegreen.com. And I'd love to zoom into your book club. There you go. So direct message, DM her, and then she'll be there. And slide into my DMs. There we go. We've got to do this. So this is your first book of biological fiction, historical fiction. Will you want to write in the genre again? Is this something that you enjoyed? Well, I loved it. I don't quite know how I'm going to go back. Um, I have written... And a sequel novella, a short, which is actually going to be coming out on a podcast. Mm. Um, so that will be in the fall of this year. And that's that takes a couple of the characters to in 1979. It pushes them forward. Um, yeah, I really I love this mix of using something real that happened, particularly in the 60s and the 70s. That's just my time. I, mm-hmm. I, I it's the time that speaks to me. And then, and then letting those characters live in my head and, and mm-hmm. figuring out what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, Sarah McCoy's got a book coming out, Set of Mystique. And I think that that's that other hedonistic kind of place. The Caribbean might be a really good place to look at and see what happened there because that's where a lot of people went. They'd go to Barbados and a lot of Brits were going to Barbados and they would set up homes. And it was that same kind of culture that was going down, but it was in the yeah. islands. Yeah. yeah, my in-laws actually lived in Barbados or my my in-laws, my 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 husband's grandparents lived in Barbados from England. Um, and but Mystique is really the play. I mean, Sarah McCoy's book is lovely. I blurbed it. I loved it. Yeah. Um, but Mystique is definitely if I were to do something in the Caribbean, that would have been. I mean, you know, it's got David Bowie, it's got Mick Jagger, it's got Colin Tennant, like it did, Princess Margaret. Doesn't get much better than Mystique. It's really interesting because they all go down at Christmas. But I think I told you when we were speaking um, at the other event, nobody talks about what's going on. You don't hear any gossip coming out of there, yeah. and it's a very interesting place from that point of view. You don't go there to be seen; you go there to not be seen. And in a starstruck world, it's so interesting to see how everything's kept quiet. Yeah. Daniel Craig flies in. This one flies in. And there are also these little tiny planes that come in. But when we were down in the Barbados years ago, the food was fabulous. And when we found was, it was many years ago, but it was the most affordable, terrific food, like all over the island. We never hit a bad meal. And that was kind of interesting to see as well, wow. because it's not every place. It's not every place that the food is just wonderful. And I don't know. I just like to see what you do next, because you did a deep dive of research. Um, for those who read the book, there's a fabulous bibliography at the end of the books you read. And so there's things for more reading. And I just feel like um, that's what people are going to want to know. They're going to want to know more once they finish this book of yeah. what was and it's a great way to appeal to a younger audience, I think, as well, because she's just this very cool character and she yeah. didn't age. She never got past 30. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's kind of interesting. So, Although okay. also very different times. And I, it's very curious 
to see, I mean, I'm, I really do wonder how the younger generation will, I don't know whether they'll be able to relate to it. Um, I will see, we'll see. See, it's, it's, I want to sit there and think about books of parallels. I want to think about how it would parallel Sally Rooney's books, how it'll parallel some of these other things, because it's for anybody who's trying to do a look at where we got to now, this is where we started to get yeah. to where we are right now yeah. and to get to the kind of writing that we've got right now and the culture that we have right now wouldn't have been started if it didn't get accelerated after the war with the counterculture and what was going on. Yeah. And yeah. it wouldn't, and also after coming out of the pandemic now, we're in a very interesting time because I think that people are going to assess their lives of what do they want to do. First thing was go see family. That was the first thing to do. Next yeah. thing is to travel to favorite places. Where do you go from there? What ends up happening? And I think it's going to be a very interesting time. And it's also people threw everything out. The whole basket got emptied. And now what do you put back in? Do you that? Now that is the truest thing of all. I think everybody is, everybody that I'm coming across, we're all reassessing mm -hmm. every element of our lives. You know, our friendships um, mm -hmm. have changed and our work has changed. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's, the whole world has changed in this, in this crazy short period of time, which can be very daunting and frightening. And also, I think if you reframe it, if you're willing to pivot to be flexible, it can also be enormously liberating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you even think of work life. I mean, I had an office in the city for 25 years with this company. Before that, I worked in the city. I would never have thought of not going into the city. And now it's like a completely different thing. And now you think about, um, somebody said to me way at the beginning of the pandemic, when do you think we'll come back? When do you think the city will come back? And I said, end of 2023. And people thought I was so optimistic. And I said, no, actually now I think it could be later because what we need is international travel from Asia and Europe. And until that comes back to the city, yes, business, business people, yes. But more than that, international travel, spending big money. Yeah. And until that really comes back, that's what the city is really, they're the people who live there, but then they're the people who give the city this aura about it. And there's two different cities that go yeah. on. Yeah. And I think that we're going to see what do people go back and do? You know, I don't know. I think that's what, something can happen. So what was the writing process like? Okay. You did all this great research. You did all this reading. You feel like you've got her. Then what happens? Um, I wrote, I wrote in England. I went to England. I mm -hmm. went to England. We were meant to be there for a year, but we came back early because of the pandemic. Um, but I went to England. We got this gorgeous little flat I did the bulk of this actually at a friend's house like a, a historic house on a hill in Hastings which is by the sea um and it perched on a hill with these spectacular views over the rooftops um of the sort of winding old town of Hastings down to the sea and it was it was magical it was just me and my son actually my husband was still here and, and it, it was really what I needed because it meant that I could, it was, it was fully immersive. I didn't have anybody that I needed to look up. You know, my son was doing homework all day and work from, from, for school. He was doing remote school. And I just was able to tuck myself away and write. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anybody in Hastings. So there was no, it wasn't punctuated by, by anything. Mm -hmm. No social life. No, this is not the yeah. other thing. So, okay, was the writing on this different because you were writing about somebody that yeah. was famous? Easier, easier, lovely, lovely to have all this rich history to draw from and stories and real stories. And it just felt much less exhausting than having to make up everything, you know, having to create <laughs> a whole world from scratch. This was nice. much more fun. Yeah. I just, and what was the editing process like from there? Like, do you self-edit first or yeah. where do you go from there? I, I self-edit and then I went through, I went through a couple of edits, but I, I don't think they were enormous. I don't think it was a, a painful edit. I don't recall rewriting chunks, which are sometimes happen, which sometimes happens, mm -hmm. um, but it was really sort of tightening it up. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Was the title always Sister Stardust? No. So <laughs> my working title for it was that so the the palace, the palais d'Azahir or du Zahir, it it it's known as several different things. 
Talita called it, renamed it Le Palais des Plaisirs, the, the Pleasure Palace. And so, so I called it the Pleasure Palace. Um, but then when it went out to the HarperCollins sales team, they said it sounded like an erotica novel. So <laughs> my very brilliant editor came up with this title all by himself. And when he said it, I just went, oh my God, that's perfect. perfect. And then a few weeks later, the cover came through and I just, I, I could not believe how exquisite and beautiful that cover is. So they captured it. it all. They captured yeah. it all. They really did. Really did. I felt like if, if you open the book and you're in the place. You're in the place like immediately and from there. About the audiobook, did you pick Fiona um, Hardingham to do the uh, audio? I did. I did. And, and actually, I, I haven't, I mean, I heard little clips, little mm -hmm. clips of her voice. I, I was given a choice of four. I have read my own audiobooks for the last 10 years. Oh, um, that's I had right. to yeah, I had to audition for them. They didn't want to use me. And I said, well, just let me audition. If I'm terrible, that's fine. Um, but I, I, I did get through and I did get to read my own books, which I really enjoyed because you know, my, and I would have loved, there's a part of me that would have loved to have read this, but I also, you know, it just, I, I, there was so much going on because I'm bringing out a line of caftans and jewelry as well to go with this book, um, oh. which come out, of it, the drop is the same date. So it's just been a very busy year. And I thought there's only so much I can take on. So let me see, let me go conquer the fashion business and the jewelry business at the same time as I'm doing a book during a pandemic. Yeah. Okay. And, I, and I've also just partnered with somebody in a new podcast company. So, you know, not a lot going on for me. Not a lot going on. Not a lot pivot, going on. Pivot, you know, baby. Just, it's all about the pivot. It's all about the pivot. It's all about what, yeah. and it, but here you go. This is what you wanted to do next. This is what you wanted to move on and do. It's something different. It's something yeah. different. And you may well, not they, have done this if- Oh, I wouldn't have done it. I mean, Sister Stardust sort of rewoke my creativity because I went to art school, but I haven't painted in years. But I found myself just endlessly painting pictures of Talita and of the characters in the book. And, and then that led to painting designs on fabric of based inspired by the caftans she wore and and jewelry inspired by her. And yeah. And you could see so many resorts where it would sell. I mean, it would absolutely sell because it's exactly what people are looking for to do something different on vacation. Like this is exactly what I want to go try and do. I mean, I've been on the Outer Banks and bought things that I couldn't find anyplace else. I haven't been able to find them. So that's like the Sundance catalog. That would be a good one because they do <laughs> such limited things, you know? Uh -huh. So what's next for you besides the Captain of the Jewelry and the podcast, a new book or not in the offing right now? Yes, I mean, I, I, I think so. I'm just not, I'm torn between a couple of ideas. So I'm just, uh, you know, what I realize is for a long time, I was writing a book a year. Yep. Um, and I really love, I do like writing a book a year. I like being, it's, it's really good for me to be out on the road and talking to people. But I also realized that I didn't love all those books equally because a lot of them were just fulfilling a contract. Not a lot mm -hmm. of them, some of them. Some mm -hmm. of them were books that I just, felt that I had to write mm -hmm. and now that I've written a book that has is completely from my heart I don't really want to write another one that isn't mm -hmm. so I almost feel like if I'm going if the next one's going to be fiction I need to fall in love again and I, I don't quite know who that will be with mm -hmm. yeah and somewhere along that but you have a lot going on in the meantime yeah so what's the podcast going to be about it's going to be it's, it's an I'm not on air it's actually um it's a, a new podcast company, um, which has been set up by a very big guy in the podcast industry. Uh, it's called Gemini. It's Gemini 13. And uh, we, it's content creation. And we're actually doing um, exclusive original content by authors, starting with fiction, mm -hmm. that will be only available through the podcast. Um, and... So of course there's Audible, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. This will be free because it's a podcast. And for the author, we we um, it, it we also have the ability to build in ads to drive sales to their right. new books, um, right. highly produced, so almost like those old fashioned radio plays. Mm -hmm. um, highly produced, you know. We bought a, we we he has been buying a production company and digital marketing agency. His last company was Cadence Thirteen, and mm -hmm. um, he's very. He's, he's just wonderful to work with. So 
my job is content. Content so, and figure yeah. out which content works. And you know, yeah. it's been interesting because even watching The Gilded Age, there's a podcast with it. There's so many shows right now that go behind the scenes. Um, some of the shows were not my favorites, but it's still behind the scenes to listen to the writers and figure out how they put things together is fascinating. Yeah. It's why I love doing these interviews. Well, Same kind I of thing. To do, love it. I wanted to do a podcast for this. I wanted to do Talita Getty. I just, I, I actually do not have the time. I, I just can't mm-hmm. imagine putting it there is so much work that goes into writing, mm-hmm. you know, a half hour podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I can't do it. I, I, but if I could find somebody to, uh, to do that, who knows that may, maybe we'll try and get that done for the paperback. That's what I was going to say for the paperback would be yeah. a great time because it's a, it's a different way to bring the book back into light yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been such a pleasure. The pleasure oh. I knew it was going to be when I ran into you a couple of weeks ago. So oh, thanks so much for your time. So gorgeous spending time with you, Carol. Always. I have loved, I've loved our chat and the thought that you've put into all your questions. And uh, I just, I love that you really enjoyed this book. Thank I you. really enjoy I have many folded down pages I was going through yesterday going, oh, this part. How about this part? I've got to ask her this, all these pages. Uh, I said, I've got to ask her about this, that, the other thing. So pleasure. I wish you so much success. Thank and, you, my darling. And with whatever you're doing next, I can't wait to keep, I'm going to be on Instagram following the caftans and everything and the jewelry. I absolutely <laughs> love this. I will love this. Oh, so all thank right, you Carol, so take care. Thank you. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks to remember, follow us on YouTube and you'll never miss an episode by subscribing or wherever you listen to podcasts. So thanks, everyone.